<laughs> Hello, good evening everyone and greetings from Hawaii. Aloha. I'm Pierce Brosnan and thank you for joining me here tonight for this live watch along of Goldeneye. Yes, Goldeneye, James Bond. The name's Bond, James Bond. And Goldeneye was my first James Bond film in 1995. It was definitely a significant film in my career as an actor and will always remain so. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I had the most wonderful experience of my life making it with Martin Campbell who directed it, Barbara Broccoli, the producer, and Michael Wilson, the producer, the Broccoli family. And I will be forever grateful for the opportunity to play this iconic character in the world of cinema. I grew up on Sean Connery. He was, for me, my James Bond. I saw Goldfinger back in 1964, never thinking or dreaming that I was going to end up playing James Bond. But anyway, enough said. Let's roll the movie, shall we? Enjoy, feel free to ask questions, and uh, let me just press here. Oh dear, oh dear, mm -hmm. hold on, let me see, okay. I'm literally sitting here solo and uh, my children have set this up for me <laughs> and I'm out here in what is called the pavilion so bear with me okay so five four three two one here we go Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the lion, the roaring lion. United Artists, started by Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks Senior, I believe, and now here we have the iconic walk across the screen. This is a tricky thing to do because you can like, well, you can look such a, a klutz, a plonker when you do that. This opening sequence of GoldenEye is, for me, one of the great opening sequences of any Bond movie. This is a, an amazing dam in Switzerland and my stunt double who does this jump, Wayne Michaels, is definitely a true life James Bond hero. They spent a number of weeks waiting for the right conditions so he could make this magnificent leap, this bungee jump. It was, and I believe remains, a world record of bungee jumps. And so in order to, to get the dynamics of it and the physics of it right, they wanted to do a live test and they, well, they wanted to do a test of this jump. So they cut down a tree the same height and weight as Wayne Michaels and here he goes. Look at this, he has to keep the swan dive in position. He has to keep his eyes on the horizon line at all times, otherwise he becomes inverted. And that's not a good thing when you're traveling at 105 miles an hour. So what they did was they got this tree trunk and they threw it off the dam and three times it snapped. Eventually they got it right and after two weeks of waiting, Wayne would go up there every day and they'd say, no, the conditions are wrong, it's too windy. 
And finally one day they went up there and he stood there and they said, let's do it, let's jump. And he told me, he said, he stood and he took the position of the swan dive and he looked over to his right with the crane that was going to winch him back up and the crane driver just blessed himself and they said action. Magnificent job, Wayne Michaels. And this is my introduction as James Bond. Photographs and images that one will live with for a lifetime. It really was a, uh, an exhilarating time of anxiety and high expectations when we made GoldenEye. It had been off the, the map for six years or so. It had been dormant. And finally the job came back my way. Uh, I was first asked to do it in 1986 and couldn't do it, couldn't get out of my contract with it an American TV show called Remington Steel, but it came back to me. Sean Bean, we became good friends and have remained so ever since. A great actor. This cast is a magnificent cast. It's not easy for me to see films that I have made. In fact, this is the first time I've seen this since I made it way back when, in 95. I couldn't have wished for a better director than Martin Campbell. He wore his heart on his sleeve and he worked ferociously and fiercely every day with a 100% commitment to every scene every angle, every shot. My son was a, an AD actually, Christopher, and he used to go in at five, six in the morning and open up the studio. And he went in one morning and he was turning the lights on or he was opening up the big doors and he could hear this sound of this man going <laughs> doing these bullet sounds. And he went in and Martin Campbell was there in the wee hours of the morning, lining up his shot for this particular sequence. My performance as James Bond was so influenced by Sean Connery and Roger Moore. I was a huge fan of, of both actors. Like I said at the beginning, the first time I saw a James Bond movie, I was a young lad, fresh off the boat from Ireland, living in Putney, South London, with my mum and dad, and they took me to the cinema. The first weekend I was there, and I saw Goldfinger. which just captivated me. And it was the music, it was the sight of a, a woman naked, painted in gold. It was Odd Job and his lethal bowler hat. It was the car. I had a corgi car, if you remember that, I'm sure you do. I could press the little buttons and the, 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 the rockets would fly out, the ejector suit. I was all of, I think, 12 years of age. And it was also the first film for me that I saw in Technicolor up until that point. Uh, as a young lad growing up in Ireland, I grew up on a staple of uh, black and white movies, Cowboys and Indians, Old Mother Riley, Norman Wisdom. So to see this magnificent film, you know, beautiful, plush theatre, the ABC cinema in Putney, was just 
the greatest alchemy any young man could have. And so began a love of the movies, and the ABC Cinema in Putney became a home of mine <laughs> for movie watching. Godfrey John, a magnificent actor, we became good friends. We had many fine dinners together, him and his wife. That's a magnificent face. That tumble that you just saw there, I, I remember on the back lot, I said, look, I can do this. And Martin said, no. I said, look, I can do it, I can do it. And he said, no, please, don't even think about it. And then I watched Wayne roll down that gantry at least 12 times. And so I learned fairly quickly to let the stuntman do it. One does as much as one possibly can, the fight sequences, there's a sequences like this, so it's obviously me. Uh, but this particular stunt now is so outrageous. The plane and the motorcycle going off. Again, it's classic James Bond opening title sequence. And one that I think is a classic and a winner. I wish I could do half the things that Bond does, but I'm just an actor. I'm not sure who that fellow is, but hats off to him. And now, <laughs> that is me. They had to make a body uh, cast. Uh, the prop man came into my dressing room one day. George and Frank and said, right, Pierce, here we go. We're going to do a body cast, all right? Lie like this, and they had me lie across the sofa, and they took a cast of my chest. I didn't even quite understand what it was for. They said it was something related to this part of the film. Anyway, many months later, on the back lot, they had my body cast on a pole, and I lay on the body cast and <laughs> assumed the position, as it were, so I could fly through the air. <coughs> and catch the plane. God, I hope this is recording. Albert R. Broccoli, Pierce Brosnan. There's Ian Fleming's James Bond, 007, in Goldeneye. I love the title. I thought the title had great fortune to it. Goldfinger, Golden Eye. Isabella Scarupo, Franke Jensen, two beautiful women and wonderful to work with. As I say, a outstanding cast are becoming hilarious. I am invincible. Dear Desmond, dear Desmond Llewellyn, well again, I grew up with Desmond, so to be working with this wonderful man was such a joy. He was a fair age when we made this movie and the ones that followed, but I loved him dearly. He was very funny. <laughs> you know, you, you reach a certain age and time and it's hard to remember all the bloody lines. But he did. He managed it and if he didn't, well, they would just write them out on nice big cards and that would work just as well. I shall probably do the same come that age in life. Simon Crane, the stunt coordinator, did a magnificent job and really gave me the confidence and made me feel like uh, Bond. 
Lindy Hemming became a very good friend, a joy to be with. Terry Rawlings, I met a sublime Phil Mayhew. Phil Mayhew, I did my very first TV show with. Uh, it was The Professionals. I had one line, and the line was, sounds like a kettle. Phil was the DP. <coughs> the opening credits of any Bond movie are, are, are a movie in themselves. Martin Campbell. Martin Campbell could put the fear of God in one. The stakes were so high when we made this movie because, it, as I said, it had been dormant for six years. And, you know, is this fellow Brosnan going to acquit himself? What's going to happen here? Martin was, he vibrated at such an intensity every day. One of his great directing notes was, sharp as a knife, sharp as a knife, 150% screaming action top of his voice. You could see actors who would come in maybe just for a day freeze in fear, but he was also very kind. He was also very attentive and very supportive to everyone. He was just extremely passionate and there was a lot at stake. A beloved character, a franchise, a family business, a homegrown British product. And we needed to get it right. Famke had a stunt double who was a race car driver. He was this tall, lanky guy who could just about fit in the car. So here we are at the chase sequence uh, in Monte Carlo, I believe. And the DB7. This is a vintage DB7. Um, <laughs> I'll save the story for later on. <laughs> but, uh, As I say, you know, I was very influenced by the work of Roger Moore and Sean Connery, and I allowed that influence to, to come into the work. I didn't censor it. I had the greatest respect for both, both actors and their portrayal as Bond. And especially, and it was written in such a way that you could feel the ghosts of, of both characters, both men, both actors. Very much so. Uh, and I made peace with that early on in the filming. And Fleming's work really is not that insightful really to the, the, the inner workings of Bond. Casino Royal really is the blueprint for the character. Here we are in Monte Carlo and this is me now driving up and we're there late at night after midnight and I drive up and I get out cut and they say do you want to drive the car back I said yeah I'll drive it back so I get out do my little bond quip get back reverse the car go back to number one starting position well we did this about five six times 
And on the sixth go round, I could smell burning. And now there are many people gathered to watch. There's hundreds of people around the casino. And the man who owns the car is there watching his beautiful vehicle being driven by yours truly. I'd left the handbrake on. Yep. I thought, oh my God. And they said after the sixth take, all right, we got the shot. And I scarped off into the night. I'm sure he was well taken care of by the company. I hope he was anyway. Franco, just magnificent. She devoured this role. <laughs> and anyone who came into her space, it's always an exhilarating feeling when you work with an actor, an actress who just owns the part. And this, of course, is where I say the name's Bond, James Bond. Well, we shot this scene all morning, hundreds of extras, big set. They did her coverage, uh, Fanka's coverage, and then they came to my coverage. And I thought, well, I, this is good. I'm going to be facing in this direction. I know how to play this. And I had it all in my mind. And it was about quarter to one. It was near lunchtime. And they came in for the close-up. But they moved the set around. And I went back on camera and stood in front of the camera for the names Bond, James Bond, with Famke beside the camera. And behind her stood all the extras who worked in the shot. And I thought, do I say clear my eyeline or do I just get on with the job? And I thought, just get on with the job, stand there, keep it simple, say the line, get off the stage. We shot it, and then it was lunch. And I went back to my dressing room. Well, of course, I couldn't help but stand there in front of the mirror, saying my name over and over again. Should I have said it this way? Should I have said it that way? Was there enough space between the names Bond, James Bond? Was there enough voice? Every actor does the same. It can be a lonely existence. <laughs> it can be very lonely making films. You get to your dressing room, you're there, you have the day's work, you go out on stage, you do the shot, you do the scene, you come back. And so each day goes. Uh, and you're dealing with your own judgment of yourself and the work at hand. But I love it. <laughs> I do enjoy the life of being an actor. And as I said, playing part of Bond changed my life. And gave me a great entree into many aspects of life and travel and friendships that I would never have known without this character in my life. This works, Esquire. I'm sorry if there's glitches along the way. I'll try and uh, do my best to keep it as seamless as possible. <coughs> <coughs> so how's everyone doing so far? I have questions. Some questions here from Anthony Cusack. 
says, where would you rank Goldeneye out of all your Bond films? Well, I'd have to rank it as number one. It was number one, and it is very close to my heart. It was a huge undertaking. Day 115 was just as exhilarating and as hard work as day one was. It was the toughest job I'd ever done as an actor. The preparation for the job, for the work, and the making of the film. was that ding sound. Okay, Matthew Wood. Did you have a say on what happened in the script or was it all nailed down and unchangeable? It was pretty much nailed down. And uh, I kept to the words on the page and to the direction. It made sense on the page felt organic and I shouldn't even be talking over this segment here. Famke, one of her finest moments, <laughs> an outrageous character. Hmm. It says here, this is Nick uh, Paul Goradis, what was it like to film the gun barrel sequence for the very first time, knowing how iconic it is for a Bond film that it would be used for the next four features? Was it one take? No, it was not one take. Like I say, it's a, it's a tricky thing because it's a massive white set. And the camera's way back at the end of the studio and uh, all you have to do is walk across the stage and shoot down the barrel easier said than done i'd like to see the outtakes of that i'm sure they're pretty hilarious well, i'm pretty satisfied with uh, the one that i did in the end um, i don't know where i got all that sweat from but, uh, <laughs> again this is monte carlo and uh, we were filming down there in the harbor and I looked at the call sheet for the next day and it was James Bond drives a motorboat in. There was no dialogue for the day. And I thought, well, this is a piece of cake. Easy breezy. I go down to the harbor and there must have been 2,000 people. It felt like 2,000 people. And I go out into the harbor in the motor launch and I, I test drove the boat a few times. It was a bit bigger than I imagined. And I had to drive it into the dock and jump out. And we went for the take, drove in, jumped out. And as I jumped out onto the dock, the Walther PPK came flying out of my holster, <laughs> boinked onto the dock and straight into the drink. Well, that got a lot of laughs. things in the movie um, so they sent a frogman out to get it very embarrassing moment this is Wayne Michaels that gentleman on the right Wayne Michaels is right there on the left sorry and Simon Crane is on the right so Wayne Michaels on the left, my stunt double did the bungee jump. Simon Crane, boom, he was the stunt coordinator and is now a director. I saw Wayne in London just recently for the first time in all of 25 years. And we had a good reminisce about these particular days. I think that was me just running off the boat and uh, they cut it. <laughs> I'm sure it was in the original.
Weapons Control Center. Let's see, there's a few more questions here. <clears throat> Jack Taylor, what kind of memorabilia were you able to personally keep after the films? Suits, props? I have one little prop. They're very protective of their props. I try to actually get the chair from one of the movies where I get garroted in this. Uh, and handmaiden's chair. They wouldn't let me have it. I do have the suits. I have a wardrobe of handmade, bespoke, tailored suits from Brioni. <clears throat> the ones from that period in life don't fit me anymore. <sighs> Little snug. Alan Cumming, such a gifted actor. Strong personality really creates a big impact with this character, as does Isabella. She was beautiful and remains so. Hmm. They searched far and wide for Isabella. And, uh, Debbie McWilliams was the casting director. She found her in a Polish film, I believe. I'm not sure what the film was. But uh, she leaves a lasting impression, Isabella. Still rolling. Still rolling. You still there? Are you awake? Wake up. <laughs> How's everyone doing? I hope you're well there in London. All my friends and family, I send much love to you all in these harsh times. They will pass. They will pass. One has to keep good faith and strength. It's almost like a Bond movie, the times we're living through here. An extreme Bond movie. Not many laughs. I want a rewrite. Yes, let's have a rewrite on this chapter in history, shall we? Back to the movie. Back to these two adorable actors. <clears throat> I think Alan would like to be called adorable. <laughs> He's a wicked lad. So good. Question time, question time. Marcus Contese. What would you say to Daniel Craig now that he's leaving the franchise? Enjoy your life. You did a magnificent job, Daniel. You were truly a great Bond. Really, hats off to you, sir. I've enjoyed watching you very much. You took the bull by the horns and you ran with it all the way. So the world is your oyster. And you can do anything you want. <clears throat> Stay well. Stay well. We did pass in the night, Daniel and I, when uh, my day was done. I knew that Daniel was going to be and had been offered the part. And he was very, he was very apprehensive about it. 
And I remember seeing it one night, we were in a club, we were having a great time with friends. And oh, he was really wrestling with it. And I just said, go do it. You can do it. You'll be brilliant. You'll kick yourself if you don't. Snap out of it and go be Bond. And boy, did he ever. Mm. It's a challenge. It's a big challenge. As I say, I was offered the role in 1986. I had an American TV series called Remington Steel. 1986. God, I was, uh, I, I, I was. I was a young fellow, really, and I couldn't get out of my contract with uh, Remington Steel, with the studio in America. But I had gone and I'd, I, I'd auditioned. I went down to Pine Woods and somewhere in the, in the catacombs they've got my audition tapes. And I met with Cubby Broccoli and we took the photographs of me standing outside the sound stage with 007 emblazoned on the screen on the stage door, I mean. And we did photographs of me signing the contract in Cubby's office. And they're all out there in the ether of, of history somewhere. And I had the script by my bed. It was The Living Daylights. And I thought, well, I'll read it once the ink is dry on the page once the contract is signed and sealed. I'd occasionally look at it and I'd, I'd see Bond written there. I thought, no, wait, wait. Well, the waiting took 60 days to see if I could get out of my contract from Remington Steel, and it didn't happen. The MTM, the studio, wouldn't allow me out of my contract. And that was it. I, as far as I was concerned, I had a chance of doing it, and fate, the gods, didn't want me to do it. And in some respects, it was, it was, it was good because when you see the photographs of me, I'm this skinny-looking dude with a mop of black hair, and uh, there wasn't enough miles on the face or character on the bone. So, when GoldenEye came out six years later, the timing felt right. <clears throat> there was a, a certain maturity to me and a, a confidence. And Martin, as I say, was a great director. Martin was truly really a fantastic man to be at the helm. This movie is dedicated to Derek Meddings. He did all the uh, all the models. A beautiful man, a wonderful man. I enjoyed so much going onto the back lot and seeing him create the train sequence. We had a quarter of a mile of track and a train made to scale, more or less. And, uh, just it went on this landscape. Uh, mountains and snow and this train, this like a model train, like two feet tall, chugging along and they put the camera down real low and uh, you begin to have magic. Samantha, Samantha Bond, my money penny. She was a joy to be with. She really did. She became a good pal, Samantha. They all did. You know, actors are a special breed of human being. They are so courageous and so vulnerable and so heroic. And 
they, they give of themselves, they want to please, they want to be the best they can possibly be. All, you know, all the actors I've ever worked with in my career have been gracious and strong and they're quirky, yes, but in a good way, in a very human way. Dame Judy. Dame Judy Dash. That voice, those eyes, the focus, the concentration, the whip smart intelligence, the beauty. She is a beauty. She always has been a beautiful woman. The first morning we worked together, we, were sh we shot the movie at Leavesden Studios because Pinewood was otherwise occupied. So the broccolis, Barbara and Michael, they found this Rolls Royce factory called Leavesden. In fact, they used to make fighter jets there during the Second World War. And it was old, it was cold, it was dank. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was, a, it was a horrible, smelly old place. But that became our home for well, a year, really preparation and then the shooting of the movie and I remember sitting with Judy before we did our first scene together and it was a big scene it's coming up here shortly and we sat around this little gas fire heater because it was so cold with blankets on our knees and I said do you like filming? And she said, oh God, no, I hate it, I, I hate it, it terrifies me. I said, really? I said, well, you prefer the stage? And she said, no, 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 that terrifies me too. I like to be downstage, facing upstage, in a blonde wig. <laughs> but, of course, we know that not to be true, because whatever stage she's on, whatever space she in, she, in, she's in, she inherits that space with the greatest command of performance and humanity. Okay, let's have a question here, let's see. Dean Diem, Diem Su, Diem Dionisu, Dean Dionisu. How do you feel GoldenEye has held up as a film today and for the video game to still be regarded as one of the greatest first person shooters of all time? GoldenEye, the video game, was unique, it was one of a kind. I have young people come up to me today saying they grew up on the game. They grew up on the movie and then they grew up on the game. I played the game once. Shot myself in the foot. <laughs> and, um, I actually did shoot myself in the foot too on a, on a Bond movie with a blank. But GoldenEye holds up very well. I'd like to say it's a classic. Dare I say it's a classic? Well, it's definitely a classic for me. Oh. <coughs> I went on to do three other Bond movies, of which I'm very proud of. And like I say, it enabled me to go on and have a career as an actor and to remain working all these years. So it is the gift that keeps giving. And people would say, well, don't you feel trapped by it? Only if you allow yourself to feel trapped by it. One has to go to higher ground. <laughs> because they will, 
That's a bad hair, hair day there. Something went wrong. It was all nice and then it was chaotic. <laughs> Jeffrey Westhoff asked, one of my favorite photos is you with your arm around Roger Moore on the day he visited the Golden Eye set. Could you describe that day and your relationship with Sir Roger? Well, I was a huge fan of Sir Roger Moore's. Again, I grew up on a saint. I think like every young lad in those days at school you would draw the saint on your, on your notebook. Uh, and I wanted to have my hair like Roger Moore. <laughs> I remember training my hair and combing my hair to look like Simon Templar. Can you believe it? Yes, I think you can. Good hair. Look at that hair on that fine fellow there. That wild colonial boy. But yes, Sir Roger came to the set. I was very honored and very proud to stand beside him that day. And he was very gracious. And of course, I had known him because my late wife, Cassandra Harris, had worked with Roger in For Your Eyes Only. And in some respects, that's where the story begins. My relationship with the character of James Bond. Cassie, my late wife, played Liesel von Schlaff in For Your Eyes Only with Roger. And they filmed in Corfu. And she went out there, and I brought the children out, my stepchildren, Charlotte and Christopher. We managed to pitch a ride and go along. And it was so so exciting <laughs> to to be on a James Bond set and to have your your wife be a James Bond girl and of course we would joke about me being the next James Bond again never thinking or wishing or desiring the role but just I think every actor has it in his mind maybe to play James Bond And when the movie came out, uh, we did go out to California and we visited with, with Covey and Dana and they took such good care of us. <laughs> I remember driving, driving home from their home one night and um, you know, I was driving a lime green pacer. You'll have to Google that one. It was an ugly car. I was doing my best James Bond impersonation that night. So that's where my first encounter with the world of Bond came into play. Barbara and Cassie became very good friends. And here we go. Dame Judy and I am sexist, misogynist dinosaur that comes off her tongue more trippingly than mine. Martin said to her on this particular day, and this is the day I, I just spoke of, it being so cold on the set, he said, maybe you should have a cup of tea. And she said, oh God, no, 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 I don't want a cup of tea. My hands won't stop shaking. Give me a scotch, or in this case, a bourbon. So there she sat, and once she fixes you with those laser eyes, it's, it's hard to look away. Hmm. And the watch, the Omega watch, I love watches. Always have loved watches. I love that particular watch. It was, uh, was and remains a fabulous timepiece. Strong, elegant, bold, and uh, tells good time. <laughs> Am I still rolling? Gosh, 
I forgot my glasses. Hmm. As you can see, I've got a healthy red glow. The wife's got me out in the garden. Lindy Hemming, the costume designer, again, an essential part of creating the character and had the suits made by Brioni, beautiful suits. And so when you put the suit on, it was like putting on a suit of armor. You really felt like the character it gave you a certain presence. elegance. I think I'm going to go all the way here without stopping, I hope. You can go make a cup of tea right now. But you shouldn't because these two actors are so darn good. And you'll see the producer, Michael Wilson, very quickly here. Um, he will be on the left of frame in the glasses. And he, of course, is a producer. There he is, Michael Wilson. You missed him. Gottfried's got such a magnificent face. <laughs> Look at that. Such a lovely man, such a good fellow. I was blessed in all the movies I made of Bond to have such great actors. It was a, it was a, uh, a workshop in itself in performance to see how people equip themselves in such a, a big arena as it always is. Hmm. Let me see. Connor Furlong. Quentin Tarantino wanted to make a Bond film with you. It's true. Might you two ever make your own spy thriller together? Yes, I'd love to think so. Quentin, you know where to find me. But right now, Desmond Llewellyn. Once more, the one and only Desmond Llewellyn. Oh, pay attention, Bond. There you go, maybe I could come back as Q. But yeah, Des, um, Desmond, Quinton, uh, he was after Kill Bill 2, and uh, he wanted to meet me. And I went up into Hollywood one day from the beach, and I met him at the Four Seasons. I got there at 7 o'clock. I like to be punctual. I'm always punctual. 7.15 came round. No Quinton, he was upstairs doing press on Kill Bill. And... Uh, Someone sent over a martini, so I had the martini, and uh, I waited, it was 7.30, and I thought, well, where the heck is he? Word came down, apologies, so I thought, well, I'll have another martini, and uh, eventually he came down, and he started ordering apple martinis. Well, we were fairly snockered. I was fairly snockered. But he did. He was pounding the table, saying, you are the best James Bond. I want to do James Bond with you. And it's very close quarters in the restaurant. I said, Quentin, please, calm down, calm down. But you don't tell Quentin Tarantino to calm down. Why is that beeping? Anyway, he wanted to do James Bond. I went back to the shop and told them, but it wasn't meant to be. No Quentin Tarantino for James Bond. What a shame. That would be a good one to watch. <laughs> Look at your guy. <laughs> oh, it's the humor. It's the humor that 
is not there now in the Bond movies. It was the tongue in cheek. It was, you know, Connery's flip and throw away and Roger Moore is delightfully arched and kind of tongue in cheek throw away. So I try to do the same. I try to keep that lightness of touch. And try to be believable as a secret agent. <laughs> For the license to kill. Ah, Don Baker. Steals the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> One of these cars called Ladders. Tight quarters, that's for sure. But that was the gag. There you go. Oh, getting a little tough here. Oh, innuendo, innuendo, innuendo. God, my hair was black. I had a lot of it. Well, I still got it. Not quite sure what that's all about. Oh. Excuse me, I have to just uh, ask for more water. Um. This scene was shot uh, in the heart of London, around uh, not St. Petersburg or wherever it was supposed to be. Okay, time for a question. Thank God for these questions, really. Um, Hmm. <clears throat> Chris Kirk, did you enjoy the surfing in Die Another Day? Well, I remember opening the script and I thought, oh my God, surfing. I don't even boogie board, body board, whatever you call it. And, you know, because it opens on a howling moon, North Korea. And my good buddy, Bron Royland said, who is a surfer in Malibu? He said, there's only one man who can do this, Laird Hamilton. And so it became Laird Hamilton as James Bond. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, brilliant. We're getting through it. So, yes, he said, Laird Hamilton. And I looked at this magnificent man's work, catching these 
ginormous waves in Chaipu and the producers went for it and so Laird Hamilton did the surfing sequence right after Christmas that particular year he went out to Jaws and him and four other guys I think full camouflage suit with night vision goggles in the middle of the day because they shot day for night but to catch the monster waves that they were catching pretty dangerous especially with goggles on but it looked so impressive <laughs> and of course as I say I don't surf I'm just an actor I don't jump out of planes I'm just an actor So then it came time to put me into the sequence and I found myself on the set one day squeaking down the hallways of Pinewood Studios in a full camouflage wetsuit, standing there with a massive surfboard which was about 15 foot long and all I and they were spritzing me down <laughs> and all I had to do was kind of go up this little pathway, kneel down, lift my goggles up. And that was my contribution to that sequence in the movie. <clears throat> oh, the joy of it all. Mm. This sequence right here was my very first day. Bobby Coltrane and I, that hand right there, that right hand, you can see the finger. There is a story, Minnie Driver, I'd known Minnie before this movie. She was a friend of my children's. There she is, Minnie, singing Stand By Your Man in Russian. But it was my very first day, that sequence when I put the gun to Robbie's head, with the first shot, the shooting anamorphic, you see everything, the camera pulls back. What had happened was, I'd sliced this finger open right here, this pinky. And I had to have my hand in a climate splint for about 10 weeks before filming and that splint came off the morning that this very first day of shooting and when your hand is bent like that so long it's really hard to straighten it out and here was the finger and we went for the first take <laughs> for the first take and the finger went doink Martin Campbell said, cut, 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 cut. What the f what's going on? I said, don't worry, Martin, don't worry, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. <sighs> God, this is not the beginning. All right, let's go again. Robbie comes through the curb. Sushi, down to the head. Only three men in the world on that weapon, and I've killed two of them. <laughs> I said, where's the nurse? And so I, I got a band-aid and you know, Martin said, he said, get the rubber gun. I said, no, rubber gun, no, 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 real gun. Anyway, I got a band-aid and I stuck my finger down to the gun. We went for the take and it's in the movie. There you go. Again, this sequence, very first day of filming, mild catastrophe, but we got through it. And then a six page scene with the great Bobby Coltrane. Easy, easy first day. Not really, no.
By now, this, this is the afternoon for doing this sequence. I'm feeling pretty good about my day's work and being bond. By this time, you're just, you're going, you're jumping, you're, you're, you're in another mindset and zone of life. Hopefully you're in the movie, you're in the moment of the movie. And again, when you're working with great actors like Robbie Coltrane, Dane Judy, Michael Kitchen, they make you so real, they create such a reality that if you're good enough, you can calm down and relax and listen, you can find a performance and bring all of what you've studied and learned with you. This is in a studio. We've got this beautiful pool and this is where on the top gets me in her clutches. So calm, so over the top. And that's where, you know, again, trying to play this role, I could see Roger's way of playing it, I could see Sean's way of playing it. And I stole from both, uh, because both had meaning to me. And once I allowed myself to do that, I was free to find my own personification as the character. <coughs> and it's trusting, trusting yourself, having the confidence in yourself to stand there and deliver. Oh boy, I hope this is working. I do hope it's working. I don't want to have to do this ever again. Really. I have done it for other movies. But other movies aren't James Bond movies. And when this invitation came in the, the other day, I thought, well, why not? These are hard times in life right now, so it's good to be with you all tonight. <laughs> it's good to be able to share these stories with you. And that's why I'm doing it. I, I love this film. I love all the actors in the film. The life that has come from making these movies and to be able to share it with you all this evening in these times is very meaningful, <laughs> very, very important. Hmm. This is on the back lot of Leavesden Studios and it's and graveyard for all the Soviet leaders and so-called leaders. And a little swift rabbit punch always works a treat. Question. <laughs> Sorry, drifting off there. I was getting cable for a moment. Where are we? Well, there I am. 
there. Entropic Decay Gaming asked, what scenes in GoldenEye were the most fun to film and which ones were the most challenging? They were all challenging. Every day was a challenge because every day there was a new experience and every day was first day almost. We rehearsed. Uh, Martin and I and the other actors, we rehearsed as much as possible, but the rest, you show up and you have really no idea of, you have some idea because it's written on the page what's going to happen, but the actual physicality of it, the geography of it is, is happening right there and then in the moment. The fight sequence with Sean at the end of this film, we rehearsed for about four weeks. That was a great challenge. That was very demanding. On the antennae at the end of the film, that just ripped the hands off you and the shins. Uh, you know, you can spend two weeks on an action sequence and then at the end of the action sequence you have to come in with the pithy remark or the one-liner which are always tricky to do and to kind of hit on the head at least I find them tricky to do oh wow it's, it's hot in here I want to open the doors but if I open the doors you won't be able to hear me because the chickens will be out there and the trade winds will be blowing in, so uh, I'll stay put. David Corr asks, what's your favorite gadget or car from the James Bond films? The Vanquish. Uh, the Vanquish, which uh, was in the last Bond movie I did. Uh, up until that point, I'd been driving BMWs. And BMW had 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 the uh, had the flagship for the Bond car. But my last Bond movie, there it was. The Aston Martin. And I said to my agent at the time, Fred Spector, still a good friend and my agent, I said, I'd love to get one of these. He said, Don't worry, we'll fix it. We'll fix it. We'll get you one. Easy. I said, Fantastic. Fantastic. I said, Because, you know, why not? And right before they announced that movie. They reneged. They said, no. I said, what? I'm going to work my tail off for the next six months, for the next year. One car. And tomorrow's the press conference. And they say no now? I said, look, I... That's just, that's just not cricket. Come on now. I'm not going to go near that car tomorrow. Etc, etc, etc. Anyway, Fred, my agent, called back later that night and said, yes, don't worry, all's good. You've got a car. I said, I want it in writing. And they did. They wrote a letter saying that they would build me a vanquish. And one of the joys of making the film 
was going down to the Aston Martin uh, workshops, which you know, escapes me right now, but watching my Aston Martin being built. And I met all these great men who were designing it, putting the chassis together, the bodywork, and I went out on the track and I, I spent a whole day driving this machine. And the movie ended and finished and about three months after I finished the film, it arrived at my house. This gorgeous silver, it was diamond flecked. Uh, they'd actually designed it specifically for me, this beautiful silver diamond colored Aston Martin. It was stunning. There was no other car like it on the road. Sadly, uh, <clears throat> it burnt in a house fire. But that's another story. But all that's left of the vanquish are the two nameplates that sat on either door hand built for Pierce Brosnan and Vanquish. So two name plates and eight screws. I have them in a little plug. <laughs> Life. Mm. Are we rolling? Are we rolling? Still there. Have you had a cup of tea? Had a little wine, a little cocktail maybe. Oh, good. Well, I hope this works. As I say, I don't watch myself. I, my children have actually, <coughs> they've, uh, <laughs> They criticized me and said, Dad, you've never watched a James Bond movie with us. And I haven't. Just, you make the movie and move on. But sitting with you all and watching it, of course, with the, the sound off does help. But, uh, this is quite enjoyable. <laughs> I feel somewhat in control of the moment. Question time. Harry Steele, does Pierce remember the first time the cameras rolled on him as James Bond, that first time he heard action and knew that this was it? Well, I've answered that question, and yes, that is seared in my memory. Juliet Parkin, would you return as a villain? If asked, yes. I believe so.
Jane Botkin. What was the one scene where you really felt like you nailed the James Bond character? I think as I went on, I obviously got more competent and relaxed in playing the role, and that's an essential part of playing any character. But after GoldenEye, there was a, a certain sense of relief. A certain sense of ownership. But there was also a certain sense of could do better. Now, how do how does one really uh, inhabit the role? It's such an elusive character in many aspects. So it's really the confidence of you as the man playing the role with as much assuredness as possible. And of course, the director that you have at the helm. And as I say, Martin was magnificent. He really did keep you on your toes. Classic shot right there. It's incredible how moments come about like that. I've seen that photograph so many times. Keith Hampshire was the photographer on this and Keith Hampshire had worked with Roger. And Keith Hampshire, a wonderful man. Yeah, he, he was a good pal on the set. We played backhand constantly. He owes me money still. <laughs> this sequence right here we shot at Leavesden Studios. We all gathered one day to watch this tank. Gary Powell was the tank driver. The Powell family, well-renowned stunt family in the English film community and internationally. Not an easy thing to drive a tank. Behind that wall there was a ramp that went up. So when he went through, you think of coming down in a 3,000 ton tank, that's going to hurt, but he did it. Anyway, this is the tank sequence, and <laughs> I said to them, uh, so how does this work? I mean, I've never ridden a tank before, and they said, don't worry about it, just sit in here, and, and I, I sat there in the tank with my head poking out the top of it, and I, I I sat on an apple box, like this guy here, sitting on an apple box with nothing. Just, that's the, I sat in there and there was nothing. So all of this is me just doing jiggery pokery and looking like I'm driving a tank. It is a fabulous sequence, outrageous. I didn't get to go to St. Petersburg it was a little tricky in those days with uh, the, the politics and they were concerned for my safety and other people's safety. But they thought it was going to be too high profile for me to go to St. Petersburg. Also, they couldn't have the tank on the streets because the streets in St. Petersburg are very fragile and the tank could easily slip through. That's what I was told. But there you go, absolutely Oscar-winning performance for tank driving. Juliet Parkin asks, what was the most challenging stunt I had to perform? 
Uh, one that I remember was uh, in uh, The World Is Not Enough, Tomorrow Never Dies, I'm not sure which one it is actually, but Bond is down this uh, tunnel and it's a nuclear tunnel and there's an explosion and he has to jump onto these wires and travel down the tunnel. And I said I would do it. And I remember going to work on that Monday morning and saying goodbye to my wife, Keely, and our little son, Dylan. And, you know, by mid-morning, I'm, I'm hanging on a wire. Uh, well, they take me down the tunnel. And as I walk down the tunnel to get rigged up and to be hooked up onto the wire, I look to the right and to the left, and there's an ambulance and a fire engine, an ambulance and a fire engine. And it's really beginning to dawn on me that this is a major stunt because there's bags of explosives all the way down the tunnel. And it's quite a long set. Anyway, I, I hung there on the wires and you're thinking, was this a wise idea? But then you hear action, the adrenaline kicks in, the wires took off and the explosion followed me all the way down the tunnel. And just at the end, my back caught on fire. Singed head, singed hair. Sprayed it. We got the shot. We got the shot. It was, it was powerful. It, it looks fantastic in the movie. And they said, okay, that's a wrap for today. And it was lunchtime. And I thought, oh, what a good day's work. And <laughs> I remember going out and throwing my bags in the car, and just as I closed the boot, there was Sean Connery. Hello, Sean. Are they paying you enough money? <laughs> That's all he said, are they paying you enough money? Well, I said, well, you know better than I do, Sean. Anyway, we had a nice chat. We stood there and talked about this and that. He'd come down to the studio to get a haircut. <laughs> oh, look at this train. Yes. Questions? More questions. Oh yes, I hope that this works for you all. I do. You know, going back to the, the tank sequence, they had about 12 cameras on it. And from my vantage point uh, on the, the set, I could see the tank come through the wall and come down and make that right hand turn. There was a camera, beautiful Panavision camera, and the tank just took it out, rolled right over the camera. There was a thousand pieces of camera on the on the road after that. Mm. Yes, I don't remember this part of the film at all. But I guess it happened because There's a tank and there's the train. 
Oh, I do remember this actually. Yes, Isabella and I do a daring dive into a uh, to a bag, and the explosion goes off behind us. This is the right angle, I'm not that anyway. That is what it is. Hmm. run out of stories here guys <laughs> I'm just enjoying watching Sean Bean and Shanka do their thing Mexican standoff. There has to be more questions. Some of them are rather silly. Let's not uh, consider those. Christopher Morales, is there one characteristic of Bond that has stuck with you in your personal life through the years? I suppose it's the walk, I suppose it's the presence and how one carries oneself. He's a, he's a hard character to get away from. Not that I wanted to get away from him because, you know, I am the man I am and, uh, you know, you use so much of one's own persona and playing a character like this that there is a there's definitely a, a melding of the two people the two personas I'm just not very good with gadgets <laughs> or laptops <clears throat> Shirley Bassey. I remember meeting her at the premiere of Golden Eye. Mm, she was so wonderful and charming and complimentary and of course Goldfinger and Golden Eye. I wish I could fast forward this for you guys, but <clears throat> I might lose picture of my son and his girlfriend keep coming over here and helping me out. Mm.
this. This is, I do remember this. Kaboom. Again, that's one of those images from the film that you see time and time again, the two of us diving away from the explosion. I wish I could listen to it, but um, I can't remember what's being said here. And it's time for a kiss, don't you? Possibly. Looks like it's heading in that direction. And they... Ah, here we go. The romantic scene on the beach. Now, this is the BMW that they put me in. Oh, I mean. Don't get me wrong, I like BMWs, however, this car just, just didn't do it for me. I so wanted to be driving an Aston Martin, but then's the brakes, and as I say, I love BMWs, I just felt that we needed something a little bit more, like an Aston Martin. Where are we now? I believe, this is from Ed Rosary, I believe you're the only Bond to have a full beard. Die another day. In recent years, you've been sporting a variety of facial hair. What are your thoughts on Bond having facial hair in future movies instead of the usual clean shaven approach? No. Sorry, Ed. Costa Rica? Costa Rica? It's funny, you know, because when I came and I made uh, Thomas Crown all those years later, Rene Roos and I, similar scene. Huh. I can hear what 
was saying out there. Be careful. Steve Spring. If you could do it all again, is there anything you'd do differently? Mm. Not really. I did what I did. I did it. It's no good uh, trying to rearrange the past. Uh, a lot of scene does go on, doesn't it? I can't help it. I will enjoy it all. Mm. Beautifully shot by Phil Mayhew. Question again. Still got a long ways to go. I think it's time for another cup of tea. Actually, a nice glass of red wine would go down a treat just around now. Yes, that's a good idea. Forget about the tea. Just another bottle. Twenty minutes. We're getting there. This is where the uh, satellite dish comes out of the, the lake. Fight sequence, bingo, save the day, end the movie. And uh, that will be it. Mm. I think one of the, the, uh, the wonderful things about making these movies and being a fan of the movies and reading the scripts and thinking, how are they possibly going to do this? And then the excitement of going to the set and watching it all come together was, was one of the great joys. To go up to the art department and being an artist, being a painter, that was very satisfying and rewarding and exhilarating. And to see the drawings, to see the storyboards, and then to be down at Pinewood Studios and you'd walk past the sound stage and this fantastic kind of mirage of a set would appear before you and maybe another three weeks later you'd be on that set and it would be a reality and just the sheer skill of the craftsman wardrobe department, the electricians, the prop department, the, the greens department, this jungle sequence here, was always quite magical. And you were the main man, you were front and center every day. 
Every day, well, when we shot this movie, I worked from day one to day 191. So, you, you earn your money. So when I look at Daniel, I look at him with the greatest of admiration and you know, respect for what he has done for the franchise, the bond that he has created for these times that we live in. And I remember seeing the Bourne identity with Matt Damon, Paul Greengrass, and I just thought, wow, we have our work cut out for us. And I, I could see the times were changing, you could feel it. And it was good. It was good. Hmm. Yeah, the born identities really did uh, create a wake up call for the Bond franchise. Hmm. But as I was saying, you know, going onto the set every day, the, the, the wonderment of it all, and the technicality of it, and the, just the, the workforce behind creating these films is phenomenal. New films like this, but I think particularly a Bond film. Someone would pick up the phone here and ask me a question and say, William McAndrew, Pierce, what are your thoughts on Roger Moore's Bond? I've grown to appreciate the campiness and humour of those films over time. You brought a little of that into your time as Bond. I did, thanks to Roger. And to Sean. Yes, there was a, uh, a cross-pollination between Roger Moore and Sean Connery and my coming into the franchise. Like I said before, I was, I was pretty aware of it. And I thought it best to go with the flow, as it were, not to try and reinvent the wheel. Like Metro Goldwyn Mayer said, if they want brown shoes, give them brown shoes. Well, that's true up to a point. But I, I, <laughs> I remember Connery leaving such an impression on the world and of course when John F. Kennedy, God rest him, said this is my bedtime reading, Goldfinger, Ian Fleming, that just put a great stamp of approval on the books and went hand in hand with the epicness of Connery's portrayal. And then, you know, you had <coughs> you 
you had you had um, Roger who took over. Well, there was George, George Lazenby, which was a great story with Diana Rigg. And, uh, then came Roger. And when I think back to Roger, you know, he, he really had mighty shoes to fill. Because here you had Connery, just so powerful, so commanding of the role. And you had George, who gave it his all as Bond. And then you had a, a certain time lapse and Roger coming in and you know he, he had such a light touch he just really didn't take it too seriously and yet he was wise enough to know that it was a dangerous game not to take it absolutely 100% seriously but he had a light touch Roger and it was so outrageous some of the things that he got up to <laughs> I had a skiing sequence in one of the Bond films. Tomorrow Never Dies. The world is not enough. It was a skiing sequence. And I remember saying to the producers, I said, look, I, I, I really, I don't ski, but I don't want to look like Roger did in his movies, but it was just this crazy outfit and it just didn't look real and they said no no don't worry we're, we're going to sort this out and we went to Chamonix to make it and what they had was they, they had a skidoo one in front and another skidoo behind and the one behind was for me and they'd rigged three cameras one here one here and one here and what I did was kneel down and so the skidoo would take off down the mountain and the cameras were cut at certain angles, so it really looked like I was flying down the mountain. And uh, so we, we uh, the thing was that I had these short poles, knee pads. I would kneel down. He took me to the top of the mountain at Chamonix, and we went for a take. And I was doing my best James Bond acting. It was incredible. However, we went all the way down to the ski lift. And that's where all the public were. All these guys, macho guys in their fancy outfits with their lovely wives and girlfriends. And there was yours truly, kneeling down on the back of a skidoo with knee pads and his poles <laughs> and this went on all day yeah. you gotta have broad shoulders to be bond mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, didn't make me laugh mm -hmm. encryption in progress Ooh. Was us. It's the movie. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I'm gonna need a martini after this. I've done these a couple of times, but you, a couple of times. I've done this kind of thing a couple of times with other movies, but usually you have the other actor with you, the director or the producer. This is me just sitting in my, uh, my own home here out in the boonies of uh, the north shore of Hawaii. Well, it's good to be with you all. Hang tight, hang tough.
give it to him, Isabella. A little twerp. Yes. He's so good, Alan. <laughs> oh, dear. Ah, the pen. One, two, three. Was that two or was that three? Mm, it's getting angry now. God, I hope you can make sense of all of this, guys, at Esquire, and cut out the boring bits and make it sound half decent, please. Yes, I didn't get hurt on this particular movie, but I, I, I did come a cropper here and there. I got a scar from one of them. He was driving the boat, uh, the bullet boat, on Tomorrow Never Dies on the River Thames. That was definitely an exhilarating stunt to do. Because the boat was, uh, it was an Australian manufactured boat and you could only do one speed and that was top speed. And I practiced with it on a lake. And I like boats and have a good feel for them, at least I did do. But this particular boat really was quite a beast. You were strapped in. I went to work again on this particular day down to the River Thames, went up and down all day past the houses of Parliament. And uh, you get in the boat, you have oxygen tank, oxygen tank, double strap, you're in and you just go like the clappers and you hope that you don't flip it. They said if you flip it, we're at Thames now, not a good place to flip a boat and to be submerged in that kind of water, but nothing happened. But nevertheless, it was quite heart pounding. And if you did flip, you had to get the respirator in your mouth, not panic, and hope that they got to you in time. <coughs> And again, in that particular boat, it comes, it comes out of the water and it went across land and goes into a restaurant. And I was on the pulley. And I uh, just sliced my face. Actually, it wasn't there. It wasn't there at all. No, it was a stuntman. Slice my face open here. He was a big lug of a guy. He was about six foot five, and I was supposed to smash him into a wall, and I did. And his head came back with a helmet on it, and just didn't go. Opened it like a peach. Stitches inside and out. Had to shoot from this side for the next few days. Knee injuries, meniscus, meniscus, good old meniscus. <clears throat> A lot of running. You run, you run, you run in these movies. And you jump and you fall, and you fight, and you do it all again the next day. Save the world. Save the world is James Bond. Save James Bond. Hmm. 
this is a very unforgiving set. I think everyone came away twisted, broken, and uh, in pieces after this sequence. We're getting there, folks. Almost there. If you're still there, thanks for hanging in and enjoying the evening going down memory lane with GoldenEye, my first James Bond. Hmm. There's got to be one more question in here. No, there's nothing here that really catches my eye. The boat was in The World Is Not Enough. The boat, the boat, the little speedboat. This sequence uh, on the radar dish, satellite dish, this was, these were the last days of filming after six months. And I'd met my, my wife then, she wasn't my wife, Keely, and I took her to Ireland. The day we finished, the day we wrapped, this last sequence right here, <clears throat> the clapper went down, and that was it. Golden Eye, it's a wrap. And the big doors opened, and Keely, my wife, was standing there with a the driver. We hopped on a plane to Ireland and had the most glorious time, <laughs> most wonderful time. Yeah. This is it right here, the final, final day shooting. Sean and myself. He was a, a great friend to be with, a great actor to be with, fantastic voice, a great inner life presence for me.
Well, I think that is it. That's as good as it gets from me here in Hawaii. As I say, it's been a real pleasure being with you all at this time in life. And we will get through this. One has to have faith. Mankind, humankind has gone through traumatic events. And this is definitely one for the books. By Alan Cunning. There you go. It's Wayne Michael and Tracy. When they're on the movie, they became man and wife. I think it's time for another kiss. Looks like it. Yep, there you go. say <laughs> except that it was good while it lasted and, uh, there's a new adventures to be had new adventures new stories to be told there will be great stories told in this time in life and great art will come from it artists, writers, storytellers, the way we make films, the way we communicate with each other. It's somewhat a new world order, it seems like. Um, we should persevere. And let's not forget to sing and dance and be good to each other and go to higher ground, always. Yeah. Into the sunset they go. And that's it, folks. Roll credits. And uh, I'll see you at the movies. I'll see you another time. Okay. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Esquire. Thank you to all the people who have supported my work, my films, to the memory of Derek Meddings, the most remarkable man made all those Incredible models from many Bond movies. Thunderbirds. Wow. There you go. But to all you who have supported me as an actor, as a man, as an artist, I thank you so much. I send you all much love. Love life. Do good things. Keep the faith. Stay strong. See you down the road. Aloha. <laughs>